Coming up on Unpacked. She put the candle next to the pillow where I was sleeping. Mm. So Mama ran in and rescued you? She Apparently she came back and she didn't even have a scar. Do you ever have things like nightmares? Reliving that moment, it's, it's, it's a very uh, difficult thing for me. I screamed and no one really heard my cries. can bring warmth, fire can bring light, but fire can also change a person's life. Today's guest is here to share his story. Let's unpack. At the tender age of two months old, Zenzi Lorenz encountered a fire accident that resulted in his left hand being amputated. As a burn survivor, growing up with an impairment led to bullying and a low self-esteem and saw him even having to change courses at university. Today, at 35 years old, the husband and father of two, Zenzile is a banker, self-published author and speaker. He's here today to share his story of tragedy to triumph. Let's unpack. Zenzile, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kile Burkhile, for having me uh, on the show. So take us back to, you know, obviously you were very, very small at the time, but relate to us the story that was relayed to you about the night that your your life as your family around you knew it changed? Sure. Uh, uh, let me thank you again. Uh, I think just to start where it all started, mm. you know, at the beginning. Um, I was born into a very big family. You know, I was born into a family of eight. And I always like to joke around and say, <laughs> probably my parents would have might have been mathematician at heart, yes. you know, because they had four boys and four girls. Mm. And, and you know, in the Mets law, they say, what you do on the left hand side, you do to the right. <laughs> you, to the right. <laughs> you know, um, you know, how the story was relayed to me is that my mom uh, told me that uh, because I'm the last born, you know, when she got pregnant with Uzenzile, uh, it was joy and, and, and jubilation in the Renz family, you know, that we're going to welcome this new addition to this big family. Mm. So you can imagine the excitement, you know, uh, that was in the family. Um, and that was back in 1984 mm. um, when I was born. And I was, uh, I was born... Uh, uh, Mm. Uh, you know, in a small village called Pudumu, mm. you know. Um, and, and we must remember in 1984, back then, remember South Africa was still uh, developing, you know, we we're in that transition from the apartheid system into a democratic South Africa. So it means service delivery and a lot of things were, 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 were far-fetched ideas, mm. you know. So it was still underdeveloped. So we were using candles, we were mm. using primer stuff and so forth. Hosina mutlagas. Hosina mutlagas, you know. And that's our normal life. That's how we lived. So I was born into that situation. Now, <laughs> I remember how my mom told me that when she came home, right, from the hospital, you know, my, my sibling actually ran to the car, you know, and, and, and they ran to the car. They couldn't just wait, you know, <laughs> to, to, to look at the baby, you know, to just hold the baby, you know. And they were just too excited, you know. The car parked outside, you know. And then they came running and they eventually walked her into the house, you know. But the, the, the excitement and the jubilation for my family was short-lived uh, by an incident that was to change the course of my entire life. Mm. And, and, and the incident that I'm talking about is an incident that actually took place just two months after mm. my birth. Mm. Now, sure, I, 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 you know, going back to that very moment, my parents were pastors, you know, mm. uh, they, they praised and worshiped God, you know, and both my mom and, and my dad were preachers, mm. you know, and, and, and they, 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 they believed in, in God and believed in the word of God. So what happened is that we had two houses, but we had two mud houses back then, right? They were just close to each other. So the one house they used as our residential home and the other house they use, uh, you know, for church. Mm. So they had an evening session, a normal church service, you know, planning went every, well. Everyone was looking forward to the church service. And now, remember, it was 
during summer time. Mm. It was very, very hot. Now, the church service, everyone came through at, 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 at home and the church service, you know, began. And, and, and everyone went about uh, with, with the service. Now, remember, I'm a two-month-old baby. Mm. I'm in a church, mm. you know. Uh, when I fell asleep, it was noisy. You know, as Christian, when we worship, you know, we go you all go out. all in. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so, so the noise level uh, was too high. Mm. So my mom then decided that she will take me to the other house, which mm. is our residential home, mm. for me to have a peaceful sleep. And, and that's where she put me, and she would periodically go and check on me mm. on the mm. other house. Uh, now, as it was getting darker, and, and obviously she's the preacher, she's busy with church, you know, mm. she asked one of my aunt mm. to go light the candle for me. Mm. <laughs> you know, I always say, you know, I, I say this jokingly, but I always say, I think when she went, I think she left her thinking cap at the church, mm. you know, because apparently, because remember, this is the story that I was told. She put the candle next to the pillow where I was sleeping. Mm. And she was just excited to go back to the church service. Mm. So she quickly went back to the church service and joined the rest of the people. And somehow the candle fell. Mm. <laughs> I think just reliving that moment, it's, it's, it's a very uh, difficult thing for me because it's at that very moment that I, when I'm grown up, I question a lot of things. Mm. Uh, I even question God himself mm. and say, I mean, when that candle fell, I mean, the other house, they, they, it's praise and worship. I mean, that's the moment I needed God's intervention at mm. that very moment. And uh, unfortunately, the candle then fell onto the pillow. Uh, the pillow caught fire. Mm. Uh, once the pillow caught fire, eventually the blanket caught fire. Mm. You know, uh, <laughs> yo, when the blanket caught fire, obviously, you know, as a two months old, uh, I started catching fire. <laughs> mm. and, and because now I want you to just pause a little bit and think about what's happening this side. On the one house, it's praise and worship. On the other house, it's pain and sorrow. Mm. And it was only after the curtains caught fire mm. that people were able to actually notice what was happening. Now, you can imagine that if the curtains have caught fire, it that means fire has spread. It has spread. It means everything and anything that was able to burn was burning at that very moment. Mm. And myself included, certainly. And, you know, I, I always <laughs> joke around and say, I, I, I just wish that this incident could have happened maybe when I was a bit older. Mm. Maybe I could have, like, jumped, you know, <laughs> off mm. the bed and ran away mm. or, or, or did something now. Because, I mean, a two-month-old baby can't even hold their head up. Completely helpless. Completely helpless, you know. Mm. And, and, and I, I can just imagine the pain that I felt, you know, and, and, and thinking about how... I screamed and no one really heard my cries, mm. you know. And, and I'm, I'm just thankful for that very individual that noticed the flames through the window and, and actually ran to the church and said, you know, the house is on fire, mm. you know. And, and people they didn't actually take him seriously the first time around. You can imagine people are rejoicing mm. and you're talking something totally different. But he persisted, you know, and through his persistence, someone just thought, hey, maybe let me just check what's happening. Mm. And when they looked, yo, yeah, the, the entire house was, was in flames, mm. was in flames. And I think at that very moment when my mom relayed the stories that in everyone's thoughts, there was only one thing. How do we put down the blaze? Mm. How do we stop this fire? Mm. You know, uh, but for her, you know, uh, as a mother, you know, uh, I think her motherly instinct kicked in. Mm. And, you know, the only thing that she could only think of was saving her baby. And she, she, she was the only person that actually went through the flames. Mm. And, and, and <laughs> you know, people couldn't just believe that she went through those flames, but mm. she did with the aim of just saving her little one. Mm. And 
she was able to then rescue me and save me from the blazing, furious blazing flames mm. that took away the innocent uh, individual that was Zenzile. And that was then the beginning of an unintended marriage with adversity for me as an individual. So Mama ran in and rescued you? That's correct. Did she sustain any injuries? You know, that's the funny thing, you know. Everyone thought that she's going to come, you know, uh, bruised or anything. But to my surprise, she, she, apparently she came back and she didn't even have a scar mm. on her. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, but for me, it was a different story. You know what I find so interesting? Uh, you are saying that um, you... you think about that day and you wish that God had intervened. But I almost feel like your mom running in to save you was the intervention. Do you feel like that could be the case as well? Definitely. You know, I think for me, I, 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 like I said, I questioned growing up God's existence and for, for not intervening at that very moment. Mm. You know, but I, I, I grew fond of the word itself. And, and, and reading the word itself, I came across a verse, Ephesians 2, verse 8, and it says, it's not by grace, it's not by your power that you have been saved, but it's by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And I got to understand what miracle meant, mm -hmm. you know, through uh, my life being saved in that man. So now talk us through what was your first, your earliest childhood memory, because this happened when you were two months old, when, you know, a, 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 you, you don't remember what happened to you. What was the first thing you remember being a child? Sure. I think for me, uh, growing up, I grew up like this. Mm. For, so for me, this was my normal. Mm. And I think I loved my mom to the core. But I think the first time I actually hated my mom was the day I stepped into school. Mm. You know, because uh, that's when I started to really get to grasp that I'm different, mm. you know, because... Because at home, they didn't treat you differently. No, they didn't, you know. I was actually in a protective environment. Now, when you go into school, you know, kids can be brutally honest mm. uh, about what they see. And that's when it kicked in that actually, dude, <laughs> you might be different from, mm. from other kids. And, and it, it was quite a very uh, challenging phase of my life, um, having to now deal with, you know, all kinds of things, all kinds of name calling mm. and, and, and being treated differently based on how one looked. So, I mean, obviously that's the first time that you realize that. So what happened? Did you, uh, what made you say, uh, feel like you hate your mother? Sure. I hated my mom for actually putting me into a school mm. Mm. because I felt like, you know, I've been released into this wild, mm. you know, uh, environment where people are just brutal. And I wasn't used to the brutalness. Mm. I was used to love and care because my family, my siblings, all they did was to protect me, mm. you know. And even if someone maybe tried to be negative, before it could, it could come to me, you know, they, they were there. They were there to step in. But at school, there was no one to step in. I was all alone and mm. had to deal with everything on myself, mm. you know. And, 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 and that grew me as an individual, but it made me a better person, you know, mm -hmm. than I am today. When did they tell you uh, what actually happened to you? Sure. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's the incident itself. It's something that was the family never really wanted to talk about. Mm. Uh, it took them time because I think, like I said, it was more protecting me. Mm. Uh, when I was at school, you know, I remember I got to a point whereby I, I even hated school mm. and I wanted to drop out of school, you know. So it, it, it took them a while to let me know. I actually was the one that when I was <laughs> strong enough, you know, confident enough, um, I asked my mom, say, hey, what happened, you know? Mm. And, and she relayed the entire story to me and, and yeah. It, it really broke my heart and it crushed me into pieces. And it, it was difficult for me to then accept the person that I was, you know, mm. and, and, and who Zenzile was, mm. you know, mm. and, and who Zenzile can become. Because now, after hearing the entire story, I kind of like reduced myself to a worthless person mm. that nothing of good can actually come out of, mm. you know, based on, I thought, ah, <laughs> what more can I do, you know? Mm. I'm, 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 I'm this person because I think for me, I always say it was a double whammy, mm. what happened to me. Now, mm. I was facially 
scarred mm. and disfigured. But at the same time, I was classified as disabled mm. because my bends led to my hand being amputated. Mm. Now I'm living with one hand and I, all these things now are coming to my mind and it all pushed me into a dark hole of depression mm. and of me not seeing anything uh, good coming out of my life. And how old were you at the time? Sure, I was just beginning high school. Mm, mm, you know? What a difficult age. And, you know, I was beginning high school and, and yeah, it, 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 it was just a tough, tough phase of my life. You say that, uh, you know, your, your mom relayed the story of what happened to you and it broke your heart. What was the most painful thing about, you know, what she said? The most painful thing was when she told me about my aunt putting the candle just next to the pillow. Mm. Because I believe that was the defining moment mm. for my life. And I look at my seven siblings and I, why did this have to happen to me? Mm. You know, and, and that was, that's why I'm saying, that was when I questioned God. That's the moment mm. that actually was the most painful of the entire mm. story. Mm. Yeah. So where is aunt now? Actually, uh, the aunt passed away before I even grew up, before I could make sense of anything. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, I never even got an opportunity to meet the aunt. Yes. And mm. what, does, uh, what does mom tell you about what the aunt experienced at that time after the incident happened? Actually, I've, I've never even um, had the, the, the time to actually go to those extent. Mm. You know, you can imagine that at the phase when I was starting to ask this question, I'm deep in a deep depression phase. Mm. Nothing really makes us. I'm trying to find my identity mm. as an individual. Mm. And at that point in time, the only thing that matters to me is to find zenzilerance, is to make sense of this person that I'm looking in the mirror. Mm. And mm. how will this person face the world and try to understand this person? And unfortunately, you know, my mom um, passed away in 2007. Yeah, while I was still at university. And I'm just grateful for the mere fact that she narrated the story. But not only did she give me the story, but she built the person that I am in mm. terms of the courage and having the ability to stood by myself. You know, I think she was, I was one of the kids he was, she was more protective of. Mm. Mm. You know, I don't know, maybe it's because of the incident, but she was more protective but not only protective, but imparting wisdom mm. that enabled me that one day you must stand on your feet and you'll be able to do things that normal people are able to do. Mm. And that's how she raised me. If you could ask your aunt a question, what would it be? What were you thinking? Mm. Because in my mind, that's the only question. It's like, what the hell were you thinking when you put the candle next to the pillow, mm. next to a two months old baby. What was running in your mind? And um, what would you ask mom? I think mom have asked quite a number of questions, mm. you know, uh, uh, growing up. And, and some of the questions that I ask mom is to say, why did you put me in that other room alone? Mm. You know? And obviously she narrated the story that I've just told in terms of her putting me to an other room. And like I said, I, I, growing up, I got angry with a lot of people, mm. with my mom, with my family, and not understanding what was, like, like trying to make sense of everything. But I think for me, uh, I, I quickly went to a, into a phase whereby I, I, I shifted into understanding me mm. Mm. And, and realized that, uh, only me can take me to where I want to be. Mm. And, and I, I, I stopped asking a lot of questions mm. about that very incident. Mm. Not because I didn't want to, but because I wanted to shift my mind into something, you know, positive mm. about uh, Zenzilerans. And I think at the end of the day, much as there, there will always be more questions than answers, and you might not get the answers, you uh, like the answers that you get. Mm. And the answers will never change what has already happened. Definitely. Definitely. You know, and, and there's a saying uh, that I just remembered now. <laughs> it's a quote that says, uh, 
the unexpected results will always outnumber the expected. Mm. And in life, what we normally want, sometimes it, it never realizes. So living one's life in the past, it's actually uh, creating limiting behavior that will stop you from realizing possibilities of the future. Mm. You know, mm. and I think that's the realization that came into me and, and the awakening uh, that came into me as I was, you know, growing up. But I have to say that, like I said, my childhood was so terrible that I only got the awakening when I was at university, mm. when I actually had a moment to reflect, mm. when I was in my room alone and I'm able to reflect on my life. And I got to then see how I lived my life mm. trying to hide my pain, mm. how I lived my hide, trying to hide my tears, mm. you mm. know, and how I was holding on to things that were breaking me inside. Mm. Mm. And for me, having those reflections, it became an awakening of me asking myself questions like, is this the life you want to live for the mm. rest of your life? Mm. And I'll make it practical, you know, and a lot of people will know this because there are a lot of people I live in a community mm. that know who Zenzila Rans is. You know, I live most of my life with my amputated hand mm. in my pocket. Mm. Now, for me, it was a protective mechanism mm. for people not to laugh at me when they see my amputated hand. Mm. And if they don't see it, and I grew up, actually, people didn't realize that I even have an amputated hand, but it was breaking me inside. Mm. Because you can imagine, it's cold, I have a jacket. It's hot, I have a jacket. Mm. And <sighs> that, that broke me, mm. you know, to mm. the core. Because it's hindering you from just living your life. From just living my life. Yeah. But it was a coping mechanism for me. Mm. We talk, it, and honestly speaking, it did stop people from laughing. Mm. But it, creating, it created permanent damages. And I, I, I started moving from that point to a point whereby I, I wanted to then start paving a life mm. for Uzenzile and, and stop limiting myself based on other people's opinion. Mm, you know, mm, but mm. that awakening uh, at university came through one of the guys, one of the uh, leaders uh, at university that actually had the courage. I don't know, <laughs> you know, where the, this guy get the courage from. And he approached me and said, you can't live your life like this. Mm. And, and, and he was quite honest and brutal about it. And it gave me an opportunity to also reflect. Mm. And I realized that, honestly speaking, I can't live my life like this. And I started taking transformational steps to change my life towards where I actually wanted it to be. Give me an example of one of the steps you took. One of the steps and most defying moments was actually I joined a public speaking organization, mm. believe it or not. Mm. You know, it, it was on campus and they hosted sessions. And I actually just thought, hey, let me just go and check what they are doing. Mm. You know, and you know, being shy and all that. I went and after a few sessions, I thought maybe let me just say I want to do something. Mm. And I went on stage and did a one minute talk because they had those one minute talk. And people were applauding and I was like, hey, Kantam created something, mm. hey. And that was a defining moment for me because it kind of sparked something that never existed. I was like, eh, they might be onto something here. Mm. And for me, that was a defining moment for me because it reignited the confidence that I already had, mm. but, didn't, uh, but wasn't aware that I have this kind of confidence. So that's the first uh, step that I did was to go to that organization and a public speaking organization and, and attended those sessions. I think it's through that platform that I got comfortable about speaking about things that really mattered mm, to mm, me. Mm, 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 mm. And the acceptance of Zenzile as the person that I was gave me courage mm. to continue to step into uncharted territories mm. that I even myself never thought I would actually move into them. Mm. And I started also discovering capabilities that I never thought I had. Mm. Remember, I thought, hey, what, what, what good can I be? Mm. 
Mm. You know, mm. and and through speaking, I started releasing things that were hurting me inside. Mm. Mm. But releasing those with the aim of you know uh, free, being free. But actually, it it was a healing process for me. Mm, mm, it became my healing process. But not only did it do, others were finding inspiration from through your, those, mm, you know, mm. sharing moments. Mm. And I think it only began, like I said, once I started reflecting on, is this the kind of life I really want to live for mm. the rest of my life? So now, um, you know, you had that turning point in your life and obviously the picture of, of your experience here became positive. But did you ever, you know, obviously you don't necessarily have memories of the fire. You only uh, experience the fire um, in terms of what you can see through the eyes of what was related to you. Do you ever have things like nightmares of, of fire that you don't even remember? No, I, I never have any nightmare. But the thing about the incident is that through the accident, right, it meant that I had to go through multiple surgeries mm. to be the Zenzile that you see. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I went to I, countless surgeries to reconstruct even my face, mm, mm, mm. you know. And, and that process in itself, it meant that I still live with consequences mm. of the burn wounds mm. of a two months year old. Mm. And I still have chest pains because of the contraction of the chest. I still have issues with my amputated hand growing, the bones growing and stretching mm. the, the skin. Mm. I, I still have a lot of side effects as a result of the incident. And I think some of those side effects, they keep on taking me back. Mm. to that moment. Mm. And I think that's what, you know, we don't know. People like myself who have not had to live it or had someone close to them experience what you're experiencing. We don't know that, okay, uh, the person might think this happened at two months old, your skin, you know, has, uh, or your physicality has healed uh, as best as it could, and that's it. But the reality is you're growing, your skin is stretching. There are pains. Um, I'm sure there were skin in, uh, um, sorry, smoke inhalation issues that you had to deal with as well. What are the other things that we wouldn't be aware of that you've, you have to deal with today as a result of that accident? What you exactly said, most of the people, when they see, they see the physical scars, mm. you know, but I had to deal, and sometimes even today, deal with some intense emotional scars, mm. and which are scars that sometimes there are certain events that are triggers. Mm. Mm. Like, like what? You know, <laughs> you know when, when, when you are in an environment, uh, for example, I'll, take, and then I'll just go back to university. When I was at university, I, start, I started my university with a BSc in IT degree. Mm. Now, here I was <laughs> with my one hand trying to write an IT exam, you know. Mm. And I always say that what people find as simple, such as, for example, control, I'll delete, mm. became a mission for me. Because we would have our two hands to, and three fingers to do that. Yes, I understand, I understand. And for me... It was a, a living hell. Mm. I remember when I had to write programming exam, you are given time. Mm. And here I am with one hand. And through God's grace, I, I pushed through, but I wasn't coping. Mm. And no one could understand. No one could see, you know. And, and that's one thing that I always say that, uh, you know, it was a double way. Me. People don't see the disability side that were created by the bands. Mm, 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 you know, mm. uh, uh, they see the bands, but I had to now adapt. Mm, I mm. actually ended up only doing one year. Mm. And I couldn't cope in an IT environment because mm. of that. Mm. And most of my peers couldn't understand, but dude, you were passing. Why are you canceling from IT? Mm. And I had to switch from IT to a BCom economics mm, mm. because I couldn't cope. 
And and that's something someone like me or your classmates would take for granted, not realizing how hectic that is. But you just made me think about something. You spoke about certain triggers. And I realized we're sitting in a studio surrounded by so many candles that are aflame. Is that a challenge for you at all? You know, we, 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 we live in an era right now whereby the slow shady, mm. you know. And if I just think about lighting a candle when we have load shedding, it, it's a scary thought for me. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm now grown up. I'm a husband mm. to a wife. I'm a father to two beautiful kids. Mm. And when I have to light that candle, it, 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 it just creates something in my mind. I'm, 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 I end up trying not to use and I find alternative means because in my mind, it's, it's, it's the trigger because it's how my life was defined and it's how I was pushed into an unintended marriage mm. with adversity. It's, it's, it's the very same candle, mm. you know. But having grown up, I'm, 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 I've started using, you know, a, 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 the analogy of a candle to give hope. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. for me, a candle, it's no longer a distraction. But I take a candle as something that I can take and light someone else's path to enlighten and be the path to enlightenment for someone else. Mm. And, and that, that, that's how I've shifted the, 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 the candle itself into something that... Is positive. Is positive, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. So what would you like South Africans to know? The first thing is understanding that and, and changing the belief systems that we grew up into our society. Mm. That when someone is different, is treated different. Mm. Mm. Because, for example, if I grew up and I became a testimony that disability is not inability. Mm. 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 And someone that looks different, it doesn't mean they are different mm. from you. Mm. We are all human beings. Mm. And my message is to say, let us tap into, into people's capabilities and abilities. Mm. But we will never ever see the greatness that people have within them if we're not allowing them to be themselves. Mm. Mm. So it's important that you allow everyone. When we speak of diversity and inclusion, let it be intentional. Mm. 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 Because when it's intentional, you get to now see who Zenzile is truly, who Zenzile truly is. But if you go into take Uzenzile and umvale mm. lenzile, you're not doing good to Uzenzile. Mm. But at the same time, you're not going, doing good to the community and to the country at large. Mm. Because Uzenzile might have the one thing that can turn the world around and mm. become the light that will definitely push darkness, but without actually being intentional about inclusion within our communities, within our workspaces. Mm. We, we, we're killing so many uh, uh, people with great possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's well said and a great note to leave it on. Zenzile, thank you so, so much for sharing your story. Um, I think one of the big things I take away is that trauma lives in the body. Even if, um, I mean, outside of what it does to you physically, externally, it lives in the body. It still breaks your heart that that happened to you, even though it's something that happened so long ago, something that you might not remember. The effects are continuing. You still get triggered by so many things. So I think it helps that we don't take for granted if somebody said something happened to me at two months uh, old. You can't be like, how? Oh, you don't even remember. Like, yeah. this, it's real. And, and I appreciate you being able to share that. And I know that you go into more detail in your book about your story, but this in itself was so helpful even for me. So thank you so much for coming through to the show. No, I really appreciate you having me and, and, and also allowing me to, to help your viewers and people at home that it's possible to move from adversity to greatness. And even, even, even for a parent that has a child that was bent or, you know, uh, dealing with something, I want to say it's possible 
for them to move from their adversity to the greatness. And I'm a living testimony of, uh, of achieving greatness through one's adversity. Thank you so much, uh, Zenzile. That is unpacked with Rele Bukhile. That is the hashtag. Do join in on the conversations. And I hope there's something amazing that you are able to take out of the story that, yes, there's greatness even in adversity. And let's be kinder to one another and let's be intentional when we speak of things like inclusion. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. Mine was a gang rape. It was six men. That was the first incident. Mm. I needed to run away from the fact that I've disappointed my mom because mm. now I'm pregnant. For some reason, even though I did not tell my family where I was, I was hoping my father could come to find me. Unpacked with Rile Bukhile Maboja. New episodes weekdays at 5.30 p.m. on my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Television edited broadcasts weekdays at 5 p.m. Open up to S3.